I talked about I talked about the six uh, transformational themes that we think are driving what's going on. And then these are important not only for what happened over the last year, but what's going to happen going forward. <clears throat> and I really want to just touch on uh, two of these things, which is how do you invest in the next phase of the pandemic? And um, we're trying to get answers to a lot of questions, right? Um, can we get the economy on a sustainable path to growth? What's the role of inflation in that? We have inflation heating up in a lot of different areas. Is it going to be permanent or, or transitory? <laughs> Against the backdrop of uh, higher taxes, how do corporate, uh, how do companies continue to increase their capital expenditures and maintain profitability with rising inflationary pressures? And then importantly, and as it gets to reshoring, how do we compete in a rapidly changing global economy, which is going through alignments of geopolitical realignment, as well as uh, uh, supply chain realignments that are, are happening also around the geopolitics. So this these transformations are colliding that we touched on. And then the question is, how do these countries like the US and other nations deal with all the problems that we're faced with now, the big social uh, uh, unrest that's going on in so many places, the divided politics, the inequality, how do they address those against um, very difficult budgets and, and balance sheets and rising deficits and debts. And then we all want to know what are the best places to invest in this environment? How do you win the climate fight, given that we don't have unlimited resources? And how do we do all the stuff everyone wants us to do without going broke? So I think the issue is uh, productivity. It's going to be the key to uh, uh, dealing with the inflation issues, it's going to allow companies to be able to invest um, and compete more effectively to uh, be more efficient in how they're operating. But there are costs to that. And the costs are it's going to require companies to upskill their staff and re reorient their supply chains. Because one of the things about investing for the future, which is what investing in productivity is, you have to have a clear sense of uh, what the challenges are so you don't have supply chain disruptions or you're not beholden to any one country or uh, political uh, whims to uh, make sure you can deliver on what you have to do. So that's going to drive a lot of reshoring, uh, nearshoring, and onshoring. And we're seeing that in so many areas, uh, particularly in the semiconductor areas, the most <clears throat> visible example of it. But it's happening in virtually every industry. Um, it's happening in the pharmaceutical area. It's happening in, uh, in uh, not only healthcare, but uh, defense, technology. All the areas are trying to bring stuff closer to home so that we can be more resilient. And we need to do things to, uh, to get uh, a wage cost competitive in the US uh, or reshoring will be a disaster. And if you wanna see, um, uh, the challenges of, of supply chains. Look at China's wage rates have gone up so much so that they're starting to uh, lose uh, competitiveness to other uh, Asian countries, but it's also part of their longer term plan to try and go uh, uh, up the value chain in, in so many of the manufacturing areas. It's easier said than done. And when reshoring can happen, it disrupts long term plans for countries like China as well as the US. And how we uh, extricate from our connectivity is not going to be as easy as uh, it sounds on paper. So uh, we think that some businesses will just not make it because they won't be able to make the change with productivity. So let's go back and just take a look at how we got here. Um, when we hit the crisis last year, the first phase of it was a re a, met with a magical response from central banks around the world and from the fiscal side to put massive amounts of stimulus into the economy. That brought us to the point where we had to could buy time for the vaccines to come, which is what led us to only having a three, three and a half percent decline in global GDP when the global economy was really shut down for all intents and purposes. So now you have a situation where that was the second phase. We're getting the vaccines going. We're starting to see the reopenings come through, but the adaption because of the uh, amount of monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus that was put in the system allowed businesses to really focus in the digital area 
and changed the way they, they operated, which made us more productive as, a, as an economy, but also led to the run-up of some companies beyond their uh, reasonable valuations or well past unreasonable valuations where they had no earnings and were selling for hundreds of multiples of their of their potential or infinity on their on their earnings. So we see this is a different phase now. We're coming into a more normal phase on the reopening where you're going to have this blend of the digital economy improving productivity and the reopening of the economy from the service industries adding that much more firepower, which is part of what's leading to this release of the pent up demand and opening up a new, uh, a new aspects of the economy that were previously being hurt. Reshoring is playing a role in that. And it's also with the digital economy, it's allowed you to create new opportunities for supply chains to work in a much more efficient fashion. So the big part of making this next phase work of being a more productive society is you have to grow at a high rate and you have to have lower cost input cost for this to work because there are rising costs, whether it's taxes, the global tax coming up and other things, they're going to change the dynamics on the economy. We think that the digital economy and the increase in productivity, which you can see here in the total economy uh, price index going up, the digital economy one going down over this period from 05 to 18. And fast forward these next two years, uh, 19 and 20, and we know the pandemic has actually further exacerbated this, where you have uh, real things in the economy, like houses and others, prices going up, which we think are not sustainable, uh, but the digital economy uh, finding ways to bring costs down. And we're seeing that in virtually every area of the economy. So <clears throat> we do believe that reshoring is, is, going, is happening. You can see it in the tech space. Um, you have reshoring and onshoring going on. The Taiwan Semi and Samsung uh, plants, fabs that they're building, the tune of a, you know, $150 billion over the next several years, uh, next 10 years, that's going to bring more semiconductor capabilities to the United States, which then means the, the uh, capital equipment companies are going to come in like the SMLs and the LAMs and the CLACs are going to get their contracts. We're going to uh, try and secure more, more supplies, which is going to create more innovation, more innovation that's uh, needed in those areas, particularly in the Southwest where the semis are going, but in the Midwest where manufacturing is coming back with the use of technology through uh, better automation of processes. And we were at one uh, uh, group last week where the company uh, has several production lines and there is virtually no human intervention on the line. So it is all uh, automated start to finish. So the idea of, of reshoring that's going to create all these jobs indirectly is, uh, is, prob is a part of it. But the job mismatch for skills is going to be very important that we work through. But it will create opportunities for new areas uh, to build up again. So I think we're going to have a different economy when we bring back manufacturing. And just to give you a sense, in the manufacturing sector, we are now at the same uh, level number of jobs in manufacturing in the US that we were in the 1940s. Uh, so we're at about 12 and a half million jobs, which is where we were in the 1940s. In 2010, <clears throat> manufacturing jobs represented about 34% of all jobs. Uh, today, it's probably around, uh, I think, uh, 6% or less. Um, so it's really declined considerably, but uh, it is still an important part the jobs might not be as plentiful as we reshore as they were in the past because a lot of the process is going to be automated, but it does require upskilling and we're going to have to focus on that. So for us, we think this is a real change that's coming. Nearshoring is the other element of it where we're going to work more supply chains with Mexico and Canada and the U.S., in Europe, they're going to do the same thing, get nearshoring and uh, across countries in the region that will allow them to operate better. Uh, but we do see in uh, the trip to Ohio is a real reinforcement of the competitive advantages, so many of them that the U.S. has to be self-reliant when, when we do have um, a much lower reliance on exports in the rest of the world and have a consumer-driven economy that's 70%, that's going to make a lot of the companies that have the ability to incorporate reshoring and onshoring with 
uh, advanced manufacturing capabilities to uh, be the winners. And they will you'll see a big differentiation in the companies that uh, succeed in this environment. So Mark, with that, I'll stop and open it up. Okay, questions, comments? Here we go. <clears throat> so may, um, maybe this could be an anecdote from, from your trip, but has our, has our technology in manufacturing advanced to the point where we, where we can indeed overcome you know, the, the labor cost differential or are we just close enough that you know, for sort of strategic imperative, it, it still makes sense? I think it's gonna depend on the different uh, areas uh, and the level of complexity. Uh, a lot of supply chains are so deeply rooted already that they will be much slower to move and harder to move because of either the skills or the level of sophistication. I think that's going to be what differentiates area industries from the ones that are can do it more easily and the ones that are going to be a little bit slower to move. But it yeah. is a part of it. We will know more about that at a later date too, Bill. Unfortunately, that uh, you don't know how how well the supply chains can transfer until you actually transfer them. So I think that's going to be a very interesting element that uh, you know what you plan and what happens in reality are often two different things. So I think that's gonna be a much uh, more challenging thing than we think. Right. I, I guess, you know, sort of further downstream, you know, to that, and again, it's, it's, it's probably like way, way too early to, to tell, but, you know, with that, um, would, I guess, under a scenario, sort of pick one, what do you think potential impact might be like on, you know, global shipping? Either you know air or or by sea. Any any, any this is a pop quiz at, at eight a.m. So. Yeah, thanks, Bill. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I thought I'd get you warmed up for ten o'clock. Good, so, Mark. Stephen, maybe Francis, you're seeing it from the other side. You've seen a lot of the how's the, this in terms of supply chain, just being in mainland China or otherwise. What are you seeing? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's going to depend a lot on, on uh, how much we are willing to automate from a capital equipment perspective, what, what we're willing to spend on, um, and then how long tariffs will, will stay in place in China. We still have 25% tariffs in China. Um, whether or not tariffs are going to be applied to Southeast Asia or not, um, they just took out mattresses um, for all of Southeast Asia. They could go to upholstered furniture next, and, that, and then that's all going to start that'll get reshored or near shored faster. Um, I, I would think that the logistics in terms of if you're trying to make a play on uh, logistics and sort of capacity within logistics, I, I, I don't think that there's going, just taking net growth because of the overall growth of the population of the world, I don't think there's gonna be a decline in the overall volumes of, uh, of shipping air or, or ocean. Um, and even, even what we're seeing funny things now where the new product development teams in Asia are ideating so quickly and, and they're actually drop shipping small package from China or Southeast Asia to, to North America. So you have upticks in certain things because technology is enabling people to ship things further, faster. Um, so I, I wouldn't make a play on logistics. Um, additive manufacturing is another issue that's going to determine what moves and how fast to and how fast you can, you know, create parts and things that you need for your for your lines and all that and, and the whole process of what you can do with uh, 3D printing and the like is actually another element that is still in the early stages of being figured out. But Bill, I think this I think the supply chain issue of uh, logistics it everyone's concerned now the high prices will resolve itself uh, as we get supply back up to meet the demands and you'll see the pricing come down and you'll have less of a backlog and that stuff should work itself out in our view over the next quarter or two, which will bring shipping costs down. And then that also obviates the need to move stuff around just because of shipping prices. 
And I, I would just add one one final thing on that is that it's every industry is so idiosyncratic that I think it would be um, to, to say anyone who, who claims that they understand what's going to be the impact on an industry without having done the very, very detailed sort of 5,000 foot, 1,000 foot analysis on it, I wouldn't trust it. You, you mean, Francis, that's what you do? Well, I'm always selling, I'm right? I'm always closing, yes. I'm joking. <laughs> But I'll just anecdotally, to, I saw two things on the labor market. One came from a staunch Democrat that thinks Biden went the went too far. Um, and then from a manufacturer up in Cleveland, who, by the way, you know, is paying the top, you know, just top, top rates and can't get people. Uh, but he also has a books of business expansion galore. That give me capital and he'll you know, he'll launch uh, new lines. So it's sort of an interesting dynamic. And then I saw Ohio basically saying, you can be educated for life. Like they're trying to create a whole new programs um, to be, to adapt to reskilling uh, with this, with this reshoring in part and, and otherwise. But robotics galore, catch up. Yeah, there's Inno there. innovation hubs that they're developing are really uh, pretty interesting as well. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I I guess I'll, I'll I'll throw in one one interesting anecdote on uh, on labor shortage. There's a uh, there's a billboard out in a major intersection not far from where I live that's advertising for truck drivers, and they're offering a fifty thousand dollar bonus on top of you know whatever you would earn in your first year which which to me sounds like an awful lot uh you know a very meaningful multiple probably you know multiple or partial multiple of of, of a salary there well that goes back to logistics but yep. dom domestic logistics but what, what other people just for you know uh but sala maybe they're different dynamics for sea out of malaysia or Oh, sure. Um, so Malaysia, we are still um, focusing on rolling out the vaccine because compared to, you know, Singapore, uh, our neighbor, we have done, um, we have not, you know, we have not even reached anywhere 50% of our population. So that's the key uh, criteria right now. And because of that, um, it, our number of infected cases per capita has already uh, increased um, even more than India. So that's alarming. So we are on a more strict mm. lockdown right now, um, working from home, no restaurants, only for takeaways, you know. So yeah, that's the main priority. And because of this, uh, I think our GDP growth has declined um, slightly, um, but expect to rebound next year, hopefully. Yep, so that's, that's what's happening here right now <laughs> in Malaysia. Yeah, no, it, I, 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 I'm glad you reminded me because if you go going to Ohio, they changed all the rules. Like, like it's no masks unless you're in an airport or an airplane. Mm -hmm. And I felt like COVID was over when, on Tuesday, on Wednesday morning. Um, but That's yeah, it's great. It, well, it's it's great, but I work. I have, we have to be mindful. Yeah, definitely. Of your situation. Yeah. Any other? Uh, Amit, I know you're coming to New York for a while, or how's the UK? Hey, Mark, sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's um, op opening up despite uh, despite the work of uh, the Indian variant, uh, which is an unfortunate name. Um, but yeah, I think things, I think seem to be getting back to normal here, which is nice to see the cities busy again. It's harder and harder to get reservations, which is always a barometer of whether London's back or not. Obviously, we're missing tourists. It's, it's, it's quite clear that the total lack of tourists coming into the country is going to be a huge issue for a city like London. So I'm quite intrigued when I come to New York in four weeks' time just to see what that looks like and feels like uh, in the US. And I had my second vaccination today, so I'm ready to go. So, yeah, we're all good. There's a there's a multi-billion fund. One of our clients is going to London, and they're they they have on the schedule at the end of the month to be in Europe, but they're they're awaiting clearance. 
Well, let's see. The rumor is that post G7 of bilateral meetings between Biden and, and Johnson, there could well be uh, a travel corridor announcement. Right? It has to happen really for a lot of these airlines. The New York London route is by far the most profitable route for you know British Airways and Virgin, etc., as well as some of the US carriers. So, um, but what about going, expectation. Well, what about going further to Switzerland and Germany? That could be, that's probably the sticking point when it comes to travel corridors. It all depends on the vaccination levels in each of those kind of, kind of reciprocal countries. And I think that by the time, uh, this June may be a bit punchy, but I think by July, August, it is entirely likely that there'll be certain countries within, um, within Europe, which, which will be, would be permissible for a US-Europe corridor. We've just seen in the UK, we had a green list of about 17 countries or so. And then it got revised last week, which took out a few European countries, namely Portugal. They put them on an amber list. So it's it's very fungible right now in terms of uh, where, what might be fine for a few weeks time. But if they get news of another variant getting more traction, the UK government in particular is extremely data driven these days, almost to a fault so that they will just shut down entry to that country. Thanks for that, sharing that. Any, anyone else? You know, Stephen Berg, when we were in Ohio, you were talking about China having some issues with its vaccine. Is anyone seeing how that's playing out? Yeah, there was an issue that uh, the head of their uh, health department was suggesting that the uh, a lot of the people would need a second vaccine for uh, maybe using the uh, RNA, uh, messenger RNA uh, vaccine because the quality of the shots that were being produced were not there and that was impacting. Have you heard anything about that? Any, anyone? Francis in China or those are yeah, it's it's um it's interesting. Uh, there was a, a report out today that people were saying that the um there hasn't been enough experience in China with the herd response to people that have been inoculated. So how is if someone's if the herd is inoculated then it, what is what is the response to these new variants and whatnot? And so they're very very cautious. And we we'll see there's a there's you know a couple of dozen cases in Guangzhou and they've shut, they've shut down basically the whole city, they're closing off. So I think that China is extremely paranoid and there are rumors going around that they're probably not going to open up uh, anytime soon. Especially when you see what's, what's going on, you know, uh, in, in India with Malaysia, with, you know, uh, Taiwan who, who has, was doing good controlling it. So I think, uh, Odds are it's going to stay closed, probably past the, at least past the uh, 100th anniversary of the Communist Party. No one wants anything to screw up before that, right? Mm -hmm. Got it. Any other perspectives, questions? I mean, China vaccine is being distributed in Southeast Asia. I see it being distributed in Singapore and also large amounts of it in uh, Indonesia. So for the countries which have um, uh, you know, large population and can't afford Western vaccine, that could be a way out. Having said yeah. that, even though the official figure for Guangdong uh, was not high, Singapore has closed the border for Guangdong arrivals <laughs> completely. Yeah, there's a complete lack of trust between these different countries and, and uh, that's going to really damage, you know, as you see, like with the U with the UK and the United States, it's trust that's really opening up those borders. Um, Stephen, Are I they... actually have a question. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, you, in your in your analysis, how do you sort of calculate in political chaos in in either geopolitics or? Um, or the U.S. because the U.S. seems like it's I don't know from afar it feels like it feels like a crazy place. Well, I think that's it feels like that some days when you're near too. 
Um, it's, it, you know, I, I'm not the best to talk about this because I think it's embarrassing the way our country has behaved in politics for a while. But um, the way we look at <clears throat> the geopolitical issues are, um, you know, we're, we're constantly following what the, the, the changes that are going on with the Biden administration <clears throat> as it relates to rebuilding relationships with, with Europe, um, because we actually think the, a big part of what's gonna happen is you're really going to have this digital divide between uh, China and China supporters, and then really the G7, and how does that play out? And we think there, you're gonna see more of that um, uh, realignment of, of relationships around the world. You're seeing it in the Middle East as well, the uh, shifting of, of relationships there. Uh, and we'll, we expect more proxy wars to be fought. Um, but we also believe that what is going on is, uh, is a big element of that is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, along the lines of cyber becoming one of the, and drones becoming the new way of uh, disruption. And uh, that puts us as a, a big focus on uh, defense and cyber defense, as well as space, is a part of our investment thinking. Uh, but it's it, they're going to use the uh, uh, cyber as a as a much more powerful weapon, and it's you can take down, like we saw with the Colonial Pipeline. Uh, you'll see more of those attacks from both uh, both ways, going back and forth, and play things out in that manner. And that's going to be very disruptive to the normal flow of the economies. So it is a concern and something that uh, uh, we're going to have to, you know, from a Biden administration, uh, Europe, with all the changes in leadership going on, particularly what happens in Germany, those are all big elements of how, do the, how does the balance play out as we move forward. Uh, so it's a scarier situation than I think we've had for quite some time, because I think what cyber and drones do is change the face of war. And I think that's going to be should be scary for a lot of people. Well, one thing I just I got on the on the screen, um, if I still have it on the screen, let's see here. Where is it? Um, just so Winston Ma, we have as a, a keynote for next week. If he's on a book tour, he went to Michigan um, and some others that we're gonna get together tomorrow at, at eight. Maybe we'll do, get together, you know, one, one or two more times. But the, the theme is to talk about, and this is really what you were uh, suggesting at one point, uh, Francis, is sort of a, there are different Asias, right? You can't, and there's developed, there's emerging uh, different dynamics, even among emerging. But we then wanted to have a, the, the, a breakout and purposely randomized breakouts of eight to 12 people and with, with a brief of you are, uh, whether it's a US endowment or a European endowment or even an Asian, like let's, but let's say you're non-Asian uh, and how do you allocate to Asia? What's the optimal, you know, across asset classes, across developed and emerging Asia um, and then come back together and compare notes in a, in a town hall debrief. And uh, so that's for uh, about two weeks' time. And you know, again, tomorrow at eight o'clock will be a, a bit of a planning session. You know, some some are outside of Asia purposely, like uh, Kathleen Brown and Greg Schuler, um, just to get their perspectives. So any if any any comments or questions, would just come tomorrow at eight. Uh, you're welcome. Anything else from Phil Kessler, Chris Fisher, Simon Vine? Michael Fields? Got up early in Denver? <clears throat> yes, I did. Um, no, I, I, I just had sent Stephen a, um, a question. Uh, it mentioned specifically on the semiconductor kind of uh, rebuild. Um, of uh, capex and infrastructure, and just wondering if there were any other industries, whether auto or other lines of sight for um, 
additional CapEx in Canada, US, Mexico that you're seeing from other places in the supply chain. Um, yeah, or definitely auto. Uh, uh, I think the uh, pharmaceutical space is going to go through a, uh, a review as there were shortages that hit there as well. So you'll see more stuff trying to come back uh, to the US. Um, but I also think that's an area where uh, environmental issues start to play. So there's a conflict between uh, some of the demands from ESG on companies versus the cost differentials of converting. And I think um, I think we'll continue to do what other countries do, which is try and keep the most harm from environmental stuff outside uh, the US uh, until we find cleaner ways to do it. So I think it's going to be harder for them to bring back areas that are uh, environmentally challenged. Uh, so I think the way you would, that's one of the ways to think about what doesn't come back quickly. Uh, and Aerospace any, is another one. I think that we'll, we'll see more coming here as well. And uh, have you seen anything in the chemical industry? I mean, uh, just as, a, as an offset to that, uh, uh, chemical slash um, oil industry? Well, uh, not, not in the chemical. And the oil one is, is fascinating because, you know, we finally start producing the amount of oil to be self-sufficient in gas, and then we decide we don't want to use it anymore. Um, we're, we're going to have to transition away from it. And I think that's going to be an interesting dynamic to see how that plays out because it was a big part of what our uh, economic security was when we switched to becoming, uh, you know, the largest producer in the world. So um, I think that transition is going to be one that uh, we have to be very thoughtful about as a country and as a global economy, because I don't think you can just wish your way to green energy. I think you have to have a longer term transition plan uh, that reduces the impact of fossil fuels, but doesn't do it in a disruptive way, which I think is going to be a kind of a disconnect between the wants and the needs. And I think that's going to have to play out in a much more careful way without creating a lot of problems. Stephen, from a regional perspective, uh, are certain states uh, changing their policies to basically benefit from the... Uh, extreme restrictions that, that other states are putting on in terms of what, what they'll accept manufacturing wise, or are the federal EPA guidelines putting the kibosh on what states might do otherwise? I think you have two elements. I think you have the federal government versus the, the states, and then you have the social and investment impacts of uh, if investors, investors are going to be highly scrutinized for uh, how they participate in, in this green transition. And if you're promoting bringing stuff in that's highly pollutant, uh, doing it the same way we used to do it, I think that's going to be a problem. If you start incorporating new technologies to reduce emissions and things like that, I think that'll help. But, you know, I don't think the idea of uh, just getting carbon credits is going to be too uh, uh, comforting for the people who live in the area that, uh a new factory comes in that is pollutant, you know? So I think there are really some, some tougher issues and more complex issues on the green transition that are gonna play out. I do think states are doing other things to attract a lot of industry. And, and I think the big one is uh, you're seeing it in, in the di tax differentials and the willingness to invest in Ohio, for example, is doing big advertising all over the New York metropolitan area, trying to recruit businesses from high tax to low tax states with incentives, with better, in their view, better opportunities to access the students in their area. And you're seeing that in all the low tax states, whether it's Tennessee, Ohio, uh, the uh, Arizona, places like that, Texas are really putting forward a big push on taxes and the benefits that they're bringing as opposed to, uh, you know, making it okay to bring in uh, polluting areas. They may be doing it anyway, but it's not the lead. The lead is really the, the tax breaks that they're gonna get and the lower cost of doing business and the access to talent, which is gonna become a bigger issue. And that's what Ohio's done a really good job of promoting. And then they're promoting the backdrop behind that of paying a lot, spending a lot on education, supporting working with businesses to make uh, public-private partnerships more of a reality. 
Um, and then focusing on skills, as Mark talked about earlier, it's a really impressive program that more states should do. And then they're also created a fund basically to fund the growth of all these initiatives that uh, will attract more business. So it's a very enlightened approach to doing what the federal government should really be doing in a lot of cases. But uh, uh, and they have to do it on a balanced budget and they figured out a way. So uh, I think that's going to be more the angle is a tax opportunity. Tax and talent is going to be the bigger opportunity, I believe. So a long answer to a short question. I apologize for that one. Well, just specifically, which states do you like? I mean, who, who's sort of, besides Ohio, which I think you guys, are, you, should, you should have a, you know, sponsored by the state of Ohio underneath this. Uh, no, no, this nothing, they they're not, they're, tech, they're not sponsoring it. They, they're, they're supporting it. Well, they are going to cover the costs. So you might say yes, though, though, but they're, and I'm from Ohio. So playing, come on. But he did go to Michigan. So there's a, he's a conflicted Ohioan. So I don't, I don't emphasize that to some people. <laughs> he, he was a Denison graduate last week when we were in Ohio. I think in, uh, in early September, he'll be a Michigan guy and then switch back to a Denison guy the next day. Um, I, I do think besides Ohio, the South, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina areas uh, are attracting a lot of business. Um, and I think that's going to continue. I think the Southwest is a key area. And what you're really seeing, and this is what Nancy Lazarus talked about of uh, middle, middle America being the best emerging market, you're seeing the move from the coast where you have high cost uh, of labor, high cost of everything, real estate, and high taxes moving into middle America where there's, it's just a more favorable climate for uh, business and uh, from a tax perspective. And when you get to certain states, parts of Pennsylvania and Ohio, for example, um, you can get to 60 to 70% of the US consumers in one day logistically. And that actually is part of the big attraction for where uh, opportunity sets are gonna be created and where people are going to reshore to. And that's one of the things that makes the Ohio, Pennsylvania area very attractive. I think in the Southwest and places like Texas, and you can do the same thing. Um, so you'll see that um, distribution hubs will be very much around how much can you get uh, to the consumer in the US in a, in a one day period, um, because that's gonna be the thing that lowers your cost and allows you to get the best market share. So I think that's what's gonna drive it. And, uh, and who can attract the capital and the, and the businesses with their tax strategies, because the differentials are great. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the US in, in New York, by the time you get through corporate taxes versus a place like Ohio, it's so much easier to do business than it makes people wonder why they stay. And I was asked that question a lot last week, so I don't have a good answer yet, other than I'm a New Yorker, like Mark's an Ohioan. Well, and well, New Jersey has the worst situation. Um, yep. And Chicago, we're adding Francis, you're from Chicago. So we're having a Chicago event on the Thursday. Yeah, I think they're just these, these jurisdictions are just shooting themselves in the foot. I mean, <clears throat> same thing with New York, and it's, it's just killing itself. Uh, California, um, Seattle. But as the Ohio gov Lieutenant Governor said, it's getting really hot down there right now. May not want to be there. Anyway, yeah. you know it, it is interesting though. On that, um, you know, you're talking about New York State got uh, aid from the federal government, and instead of using that to not increase taxes, they increase taxes anyway because if a little bit of money from them is good, why don't we get some more? Instead of trying to lower the taxes and being more competitive, they just can't balance a budget here on their own, so they have to use whatever means and that usually is increased taxes and it's just making them more uh, less competitive and that is driving business to the midwest and the south uh, west and southeast so i think that's going to continue yep. yeah interesting to see uh, also but the key is the venture you know the, the innovation that that's incredible incredibly important to all these cities that you need to find ways I think Cincinnati and Columbus have done it better than Cleveland. Yeah, the Hoover Institute just did an interesting uh, program on what they're doing in Alabama as well. Um, it's uh, share, I, I, share that. 
He could. Well, they're they're just trying to figure out how to create some type of uh, environment for whatever the next innovation can thrive. Um, so, not necessarily recreating a Silicon Valley, but having the right institutional infrastructures, uh, legal infrastructure, private public partnerships with including the educational institutions to support innovators, really, um, whatever that innovation might be, wherever it might go. Um, so not trying to make a play, let's say, on, on tech per se, um, but more on promoting business, really. Very similar to what Ohio is doing. You know, I think that they're, they're thinking smart about creating the ecosystem for entrepreneurship. And you are seeing it play out. A lot of foreign direct investment is going into the Southeast. It, it, South Carolina for the last several years was one of the leading areas to attract foreign capital in with big businesses setting up plants there. Um, I think the other states in that area like Alabama are seeing that and saying we need to, we need to participate in that and benefit from it. So they are starting to build, uh, you know, kind of distribution chains that can support uh, big areas of foreign direct investment. And that's the other element that's going on. And it just takes smart policies that these guys have to think a little differently than they have in, in how they're going to attract capital because they have to really sell now. And states like New York and cities like Chicago and places like San Francisco and other areas for a while haven't had to do that because they were the they were the hubs and everything was going through them. Then they raised taxes and now everything's running away. So I think you're going to see more of that shift of both population and resources. And the other thing with the now, the new future of work, people are going to be working more remotely and can live in different areas to do the same job. And I think that's going to push people into lower tax or areas and away from some of the areas that they've been historically. And that's gonna actually foster more business in, in those regions as well. Yep. Well, again, tomorrow we're gonna switch back over to Asia uh, or stay on, on this a Asia track uh, so we can understand better how to allocate and think about Asia. Well, if, if obviously, if, if, you, if, you're, if everybody's, anyone interested in coming to the Midwest, the, the other emerging markets, um, please put on your calendar. We'll, 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 we'll in, include it, obviously, COVID, subject to COVID uh, developments, but we would love to bring our whole community together again. And uh, if you have, you know, really any other uh, things you want to know, like Simon Vines on, he, he does this future work series, anything that you, you all want to, focus on, you know, work, you know, leverage us. Like Brian, you, we, I, I spoke with Mark, uh, uh, was it Singh from the Philippine uh, family? He's in Sing Singapore, but he works with the Philippine Venture Group. Um, uh, I think we talked about him last time. So he was explaining to me how that, how that was working, but they, although it's more focused on just in the Philippines, but maybe we should do a Philippines deep dive, right? Um, yeah, why not? <laughs> That'll be interesting. No, our, our ASEAN as a whole, I guess, is an interesting block to look at. And, and a lot of, um, I think it's emerging Asia. And, you know, there are uh, some, some countries that did pretty well post pandemic, but some that are on the back foot. So yeah, definitely worth a look. <laughs> well, we're going to, we're going to talk about that with, but again, with a broader brush, but we can go deeper. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so Mario, uh, I was, yep. yep, I was going to ask Stephen regarding his view on the semiconductor push for America with Biden, you know, allocating fifty billion in his infrastructure budget and TSMC, you know, committing twelve billion to build a plant. But realistically, how long do you think you know this pivot is going to happen, such that America would catch up in a meaningful way in the semicon side? I think it takes a couple of years to build the factories and then to what are they? It's really they're focusing on the next technology to the next uh, uh, generation of chips. So I think it'll take uh, it'll take a couple of years. But we think the supply uh, uh, imbalance will go on for at least another year, if not two, in the semi area. 
And so uh, it, we're not going to get supply back up as fast as uh, people like, which is creates a good pricing environment for the for the players. It'll slow down some of the other areas of development until we get that in line. But we think it's going to be a little bit longer than uh, it's not a quarter or two issue like some of the other issues that are exist out there that um, demand will catch up quickly and then it'll be solved because as as they get closer to being ready, the demand is going to be growing and we think exponentially. So I, I think that there's a mismatch there that'll take some time to resolve where shipping and other areas, the ports will get sorted out and you'll get back to more normal rates. But in the chip area, we think that's going to be more uh, sustained. Mm, thanks for that. And then it's also, you know, the view that the demand for chips is just much broader now with electrification of cars. And you've got, you know, all these crypto craze, plus, you know, the gaming mega trends. So there's a lot of stuff that is in nearly dire need of semiconductors. And I agree with you that capacity buildup is a very chunky business in the sense that it takes a while for it to catch up. So, you know, it looks like this shortage is going to last a bit longer, isn't it? Yes. And, and, and you're right. The other thing is people forget that the data center area is still in the early innings of what it's going to be. And data centers are big uh, demand, have big demands as well. So we do think you're right. There's going to be exponential growth of, of the number of chips and the applications for chips are actually much bigger as well. So I think you're going to see that uh, continue. Yeah. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Well, carry on as, as you would like, and uh, I want to go into a breakout, Stephen, and uh, we'll be back uh, at 1030. Yep. Well, thank you guys for joining today. Good to see you. Likewise. Thanks for the yep. insights. I'll see you at 1030. I'll be there. Yep. Oh. Take care. See you. Same Bye. thing. Right. So don't, don't expect anything different or hopefully better. But <laughs> no, Sometimes, you know, second time around is when it really sinks in. <laughs> That's the way it is. That's oh, right. Too, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, thanks guys. Have yeah, a great thanks, day. Stephen. Thank Appreciate you, it. Phil. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Stephen. Manufacturing is trying to support what we are doing. Again, you know, they're somewhat hampered by the stimulus that exists still and is going to continue to exist for a certain period of time. I'm, I'm grateful for what uh, uh, Governor DeWine has done and, and talked about ending, you know, the additional $300 that's available on June 26th. We've offered, you know, increased incentives both to current employees and new employees for you know, referrals and signing bonuses and everything else you can. But the key is going to be, you know, you know, do people want to come to work? And I think that is a big question that is not just a question that, you know, manufacturers in Ohio are facing, but elsewhere. But Ohio is a great place to be doing what we're doing. Um, the expertise is here. The technology is here. Most of the people that we are in the companies that we are aligned with to support ourselves from an automation standpoint are based here in Ohio. Uh, and we're in close proximity to most of the assembly plants that we're uh, providing and, and you know, logistic costs are a big factor. So, I mean, Ohio is a great basin to be doing what we're doing. We just need to get past the current struggles on the labor side. And I think it's gonna be, you know, cage bar of the doors and we'll see what happens afterwards. Matthew, Mark, just supportive of what uh, Matthew was saying on the demand side. Consumer net worth in the U.S. is up almost 25 trillion in the last year. Think about that. That's the asset inflation that's gone on, mm -hmm. and that is actually part of what's fueling the demand for mm -hmm. things like autos and and the, the way we're going about it. So, yeah, but the disparity both. the disparity must be hellacious, though. Yes, the disparity it's, it's in where the assets come is distributed this must be hellacious. Yeah, it's asset owners versus those who don't. And but part of that issue for the, is to get the spending going. That was always the central bank's view of inflating assets, which is why they lowered rates and introduced quantitative easing. It's an it, the inequality is an offshoot of that policy, and they can't solve everything. So they were trying to save the economy, and that's a 
the unintended or it's a known consequence that was coming, but it is part of what's going to drive the demand going forward for the next several years uh, that you're going to see in a lot of different areas. And the second it's thing interesting is, you say that, Stephen, because I always thought that the Obama stimulus people, in a sense, didn't take that into account, that whatever it is you could say happened as a result of that, their main you know, objective was trying to save the economy, you know, save the world monetary system from blowing up. And so whatever happened as a result of it, okay, unintended consequence. But yeah, and like you say, this time around, the idea is making sure that we don't have like a complete economic collapse. So I think the inequality is, but people are much more aware of inequality now than they were back then. Yep. It's an issue that needs to be addressed. And and they're, they're, trying to do it with taxes in other areas, it remains to be seen how well they, they achieve that. But uh, I do think the other element, and it goes to Duncan's question, it's one that we've been tracking, is there are three big pockets of, uh, of demand that we think are coming, and it's around the, uh, some of the industrial metals, whether it's copper or steel, as, as Matthew was highlighting, are, are, are really areas that you're going to see increased demand for, from, particularly if we get the infrastructure package. Supply chip shortage, uh, the shortage in, in semiconductor chips should be actually a multi-year issue that uh, there are only a couple of companies that can produce them anyway, so that should continue. And the other area as it relates to the autos is rare earths and uh, how those are sourced. And those are all three areas that I think will have multi-year opportunities for investment uh, because they are in tight, su tight supply against uh, high demand. And I think you'll see see those areas play out uh, to Duncan's question earlier. I have one, one follow up question, Matthew. Um, how how much of the activity that you um, told us about is related to offshoring? And do you see the same level of increased auto demand globally that you're seeing in the United States? Uh, so from an offshoring standpoint, so we buy four components from overseas. Um, we have a commodity called suspension shackles that, you know, is, is effectively what keeps the uh, pickups and SUVs stabilized uh, and, and supports the, the, the frame and, and uh, you know, provides for a smooth ride uh, despite the vibration. So uh, despite trying for about three and a half years to reshore those, uh, given the, uh, the material content and, and the heavy uh, labor uh, content, especially with the welding, there's just no way, even with paying 100% of the tariffs that's associated with that, we're better off doing that overseas. Uh, uh, on another component, and, and it's funny, you know, I, I mentioned the volume impact and whatnot. Uh, we make uh, for uh, GM what's called the fifth wheel gooseneck. I don't know if there's anybody here that does trailering, but it's an underbed trailering system that allows for the very heavy trailers that, you know, the horse trailers, the uh, landscape trailers, the RVs that actually fit through the middle of the bed. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, very uh, sophisticated, uh, you know, pucks and sleeves, which are more casting like related products. And again, because the very heavy material contact, those we get from overseas. So, so, <sighs> we've been 50% successful. We've devoted an incredible amount of time in, in, in the OEMs, but right now, by the way, they initially were offering to participate in the tariff activity. And so we were being reimbursed about 50% of what those costs were. And we were having to bear the cost of 50%. Starting in 2021, they basically said, we're done, right? If you, if you haven't solved the reshoring issue, then you're having to bear that expense yourself. So uh, we've been successful in reshoring the, the fifth wheel components, and that'll take effect in a couple of months. Um, but uh, on the shackle components, uh, which are a little bit more labor intensive, we're going to actually hope that, the, that those are going to stay overseas. Uh, and, and that's an interesting conundrum that we're in, you know, which is I'd love to have the additional work in house, right, and be able to add to my overhead absorption and, and give the work uh, locally. It's just not competitive. And there's a reason that we're there. And oh, by the way, when we quoted a lot of these parts, you know, we quoted doing only a very small port, part of them overseas and then doing the, the, the stamping portion and the, the welding assembly domestically and therefore creating jobs domestically, whereas our competition was going to make all of it overseas. Uh, but yet now we find ourselves in a situation where we're having to absorb all these costs. So um, reshoring is going to be an issue until uh, the tariffs go away, you know, is what I see if they go away. 
you know, we, we actually are, are participating. We had filed the request for exclusion. It was denied. We'd filed an appeal again, stating what I just stated to you, which is we actually created jobs. We created investments in manufacturing by virtue of having found a solution to only get a portion overseas and doing the bulk of the work domestically. That was denied. We're now involved uh, as a uh, plaintiff in the uh, class action against uh, the Customs Department based upon the World Trade Association uh, ruling that the uh, 232 tariffs were, you know, against international law. So it's an ongoing issue. We're going to continue focusing on investing in the U.S. and everything we're quoting on now. We're only quoting doing the United States, but there are still legacy, you know, situations that we have to solve for. The, the auto dynamics um, in terms of demand, uh, that was the second part of my question. Is that a, is just that a U.S. phenomenon right now or, or this auto demand global? Um, so I'll talk to North America uh, because that's, you know, where we're focused in, and that includes Canada and uh, Mexico because I have divisions there as well. So, but for the semiconductor shortfall and that absolutely impacted our divisions in, in Canada and Mexico, we would be at about 125% of our normal demand across the board. Uh, it's only because of the semiconductor shortfall that we are uh, slacking in uh, Canada and Mexico. And actually, at least temporarily, that's been resolved. And we've, in, in put it this way, it's not, once they solved it, they're just not going back to their normal demand. They are, again, working maximum overtime, working Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, and having been in the business as long as I have, I know this, right? They, 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 live based upon maintaining inventory levels, right? And, you know, a lot of people have questioned why they're at certain levels historically. And I think now this experience has really showed them right now they're in the 50 to 60 day range on some vehicles, maybe upwards of 75 on some, they want to be at 115 to 120. And, and, and what we've heard is that it's going to take them through potentially the end of 2023 running at maximum capacity, including maximum overtime to get there. So, uh, again, uh, I'm doubling down. I'm reinvesting everything I can. You know, I'm not taking any money off the board. I'm investing in new capital because we're going to see high demand for sure for the next 24 to 36 months. Thank you. This became the Matthew Friedman show. Thank you, Matthew. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it was great. I didn't have much material from last week, so we were, I couldn't research. So that was a big help. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Andrea, I saw that you're you're on since you were in Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland. Just curious, if you might have a Jack, Jack Wyant said that, that there was some vote that I didn't see that Cincinnati won. Um, appreciate your vote. Uh, others, you know, Ben, ben Trumbull, if, you, if you're there, it was what was interesting is that we saw the venture part of Cincinnati centrifuge. We saw it in Columbus and spades, <clears throat> but there seemed to be a dissatisfaction with venture investing in Cleveland. Something I observed maybe off camera. Um, and Lauren, we will be adding Chicago on the 23rd. Um, well, let's, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's bump heads and start planning it. I'm wondering how much, how close to what it is that you're doing in, in Ohio would you like to see in Chicago, given that you'd only be there one day? But we, we can talk about this. You know, I don't want to take up this yeah, big we'll, group to we'll talk, talk about, about all that. We can do a lot in a day. That gives us a, a coffee, a breakfast, a lunch, and a dinner. Don't forget drinks. So look at Jack, we did in Cincinnati. As them youth, as those youth would say, this is going to be really fat, man. I'm telling you, Chicago is going to be really fat. Seriously. Oh, then we might have to add a, a, a 20 second dinner onto it then. Yeah, the weather actually is really, is really good at that time of the year because it's not, you know, as a Midwesterner, you would know it's not as muggy and it's still not cold yet. So the end of September is probably like, you know, we only get like literally about eight weeks of good weather here in Chicago. And that's probably one of the times. So this is perfect timing. Yep, absolutely. 
look, you have to tell us what's happening on the 22nd, 23rd, also extracurricularly. So we'll 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 do that tomorrow. Uh, actually, and that's uh, hey, hey, both both of our baseball teams are contenders this year. And you have Justin so Fields. I got a feeling there'll be some good. There'll be something good along that time. I'll look into it. And by then, Justin Fields should be your starting quarterback. Possibly. Um, and Michael Fields knows the uh, White Sox owners. Um, so maybe there's something to do there. Uh, other other comments? No, who is that you said? Who is that you said? <clears throat> Michael Fields. He's one, one of our co colleagues on the banking side. Sits in Denver, but he knows the uh, – what's it? Uh, Jerry – I'm going to butcher the last name. Jerry Reinsdorf. Reinsdorf, yeah. Uh, Mark, I, I included some uh, data analysis for the group around Ohio. Okay. And I, I pulled that from my team, and we um, it's very detailed around uh, mental health, ability, income, ethnicity, and it's by zip code. And I'm happy to do that for Chicago or any other areas that are important to the group, and just contribute that to the group. So I just put it in there. It's for anybody to use how you like, and um, I thought just put it in there as a gift to the group to help. So. And John, you were. You were busy. You couldn't join us in Ohio, but you I, I was ill. I had a, I had a cold oh. and a, oh. I, I wasn't sure what it was, and I thought it wouldn't be okay to show up with a cold and a cough and sneezing. So, given the given the circumstances that we're in, so, but I'm back and uh, grateful to be here and uh, looking forward to catching up. Absolutely, we'll do that week. And John, it's Vlad. Uh, look forward to catching up with you soon. I know Joe and I are hopefully going to have a call scheduled with you here soon. Yeah, I'm going to get, yes, I saw the email and I will, uh, I'll get back to you on it today. So thank you. Good. Good patience. Thank you. Sure. sure. You know, not to be facetious about it. One thing I really like about this idea of the tour thing and, you know, we've in previous sessions, you know, had that like graphic about all of the different regions and how the Great Lake region is going to turn out to be a major one. And I'm not being facetious about it, but I really believe that we can have a kind of a, of a, let's say a, a push or a drive or a way to message it so that a lot of this kind of silly regional competition, you know, we don't need to have that. I really believe that we can talk about bringing more investment to the Midwest and finding a way that people in Ohio and people in, you know, Chicago and people in Michigan, you know, can cooperate and that we don't have to try to like, it's not a zero sum game. You know what I mean? In terms of getting investment to this region. So it was funny and Anessa will remember this. I was saying, I think we we we, we want to create registration forms. You can go to 361firm.com slash Ohio. Why is it you can't put that, you can't have the Michigan people sign up on an Ohio sheet. And Chicago looks down on Ohio, so you can't do that either. <laughs> so we're like, we should maybe make it the Midwest um, <clears throat> or Great Lakes. I had some Great Lakes brewing products uh, while in the Cleveland, so I'm yeah I'm I'm with you I'm a, I'm a bridge builder so let's let's build the bridges. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, Andrea's on. Well, well yeah, I'm curious for your impressions. You know, for your first time trip to Ohio. Uh, oh, it was super. Um, no, I have a super favorable impression. Um, bit of a hidden gem, as it turns out. Um, it was a pleasure and a delight to be there uh, to really see what's going on. I've actually been traveling all over the country to kind of gauge what's been happening in the tech space in various cities. Some of them are, uh, you know, the typical venture uh, cities such as San Francisco, New York, uh, even Miami. I've been spending a lot of time in Miami. I would say Ohio is that, um, I wouldn't be surprised if, oh, well, um, uh, I, I don't know if, I mean, I don't know what to say at this very point, but I know I can see why some of the local uh, Ohioans may wanna keep this a bit of a secret, um, but we'll definitely be paying a lot more attention to what's happening and what's developing there. We'll, we'll leave it at that for now. Thank you though. It was, it was lovely to meet all of you. Super fun, uh, despite the rain. Yeah, looking forward to seeing you guys again. Excellent. Thanks, Andrea. 
Anyone else? Leslie, you're on mute. You're on mute, Leslie. I'll chime in with one comment about Ohio and <clears throat> thinking about food security from a global perspective. You know, the heartland is really, it's an incredibly rich destination and um, greatly beneficial breadbasket to North America. So I think that's really something important to continue to protect. Um, I was reading about the um, 10 acre solar array at Denison, for example, and how it's covered with pollinator pathway, um, beneficial flora and fauna. And there's just so many gifts. They need to be protected because they're really important. Well, we, Denison also has a 300 acre bioreserve and <laughs> someone was gonna, is gonna lead, we'll have a golf outing, but there's also a bioreserve. We call it a, a, what do they call it? A forest? Bathing. Bathing, yes. So you should talk to Joe Starncheck. He's going to lead that tour. Yes, I'm in um, a lot of discussions with Joe and Good. Um, Good. the topic of mental wellness and nature is an <clears throat> absolutely critical um, interconnected health direction for us all for healing and recovery. Great. Very great. Anyone else? Yeah, I was pretty encouraged by the uh, what uh, the lieutenant governor um, mentioned about uh, offsetting capital gains uh, from the founding equity uh, with uh, payroll. Yeah, interesting. Well, I was talking with Jack Wyant, who is definitely a, a, a dim leading, and he was wowed by sort of the enlightened um, views of a Republican. Yeah, um, I mean, he's he's doing a lot of structural, uh, uh, putting in place a lot of policies that are structural in, in Ohio's comparative advantage, and, you know, including promoting uh, from a fundamental level, um, early stage startups. And I'm, I was super pleased to be uh, founding my company here in Ohio. I was also wowed by his wife. I don't know, I guess he's not here but she was a delight <clears throat> and, well, a delight, but tough cookie too. <laughs> if you, if, if I made a statement that I had to like <laughs> explain for five minutes, um, <laughs> but I made it a personal challenge to prove it to her. Um, what, yeah. what, did she, what did she do for a job, Mark? Did she work? Uh, uh, Go ahead, Mark. More, than, more than that. She, it, it, the book, um, one Red Shoe, uh, America's First Corporate Woman. Oh, she's the one that wrote it. Okay, got it. I yeah. understand. Okay. She was, yeah. you know, she was reporting directly to the CEO and chairman of Procter & Gamble, you know, helping them with their 10-year plans. And then she just, she had four kids and she had to move. She decided to move out. Uh, and then, that, but she came back. She's done a lot of pivoting, but she, she's... You know, she's interesting, and she's got a great so many stories, and she got a book, and we want to we actually we want to we want to have a fireside chat with her. I think the uh, the issue of pivoting in the workplace is for coming in and out, and recreating yourself as a woman that wants to raise young children, and you know, everyone makes these choices, and it's up to everyone personally how they want to manage their family units, but. That is a really interesting focus point and how in a fireside chat, it would be very interesting to have her discuss how she navigated that because it's a, it's a, it's a give and take and coming out, you know, your intellectual capital starts to diminish, your connections start to diminish. They say after 12 months, how long do you take out? How do you go back in again? And when you go back in again, and we've heard this in this forum before, as a matter of fact, when you go back in again, often you go back in at a different level, a lower level, you're going back. And certainly when we talked about the future of female with, um, with, uh, with one of the individuals that was speaking, and she'd said that when she had children going back in again, it was a struggle because you have to go back in at a much, much lower level re regularly. And um, how, how that is navigated, that's, it's not an easy task, actually. 
I'm about three quarters of the way through the book and she actually has a section on that. Um, and it's a great story. She went to go talk to one of the senior guys at Procter Gamble and she'd been out for a couple of years and he said she should do some volunteer work to get her name out there again. And she asked, would, that, would he have said that? Would, she, would he have said that to her husband or to a, to a guy? And the insights and the way she writes the book and the way she shares her really personal issues is it's a fascinating read. So uh, if you have time, it's on Amazon, you can get it. It's a great book. And uh, I actually bought it for my daughters uh, yeah. and I'm going to actually be buying it for our firm. Yeah. Uh, it's that good. Even, she even coached you to coach your daughter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> on asking for a raise. It's like, uh, the, book, it's like the book Outlier. By Malcolm yep. Gladwell, you know, it's one of those things yep. that you read and you say, okay, my children have to read this. Yep. This is this is a book I want to give to people because it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I started to read it and my wife stole it from me. Yeah, you won't. Yeah, I love that book. <laughs> it's a brilliant book. I mean, I mean this, this One Red Shoe book. Um, she, yeah. used, she works at Google and, and Proctor was her client. So... Uh. I, I would be fascinating to know that is there anything in the book that gives an insight into the title what that title one wet red shoe what that refers to well i think it's just that it, among the corporate brass of procter and gamble that must have been hers must have been the only red shoe I, am I, that yeah. right, even or is it more new yeah, a little a little background when when she uh got to procter gamble they in the interview there, they gave her a, uh, they asked her to take a typing test and she goes, I don't type. What's the test you have for thinking? And the HR person took her over, took her resume to one of the guys in, in marketing, which they were called brand men. Then they didn't, you know, like mad men, uh, <laughs> they were brand men and they didn't have a role for women in that side of the business. And they created one for her. And uh, so when she went in and all the guys had their white shirts and gray suits and, and black shoes, and she came in as the one red shoe. And that's, uh, that's the background on it. It is a, it's a, it's a great book. Well, well, very well written. She did it all, all the writing herself. And it, it, it opens up very personal stuff that was going through with her and Jack and the difference of their careers and a uh, fascinating story, two incredible people. And Jack, who's been on these calls and is on these calls, doesn't give you any insight into all the stuff he's accomplished in his life as well. Another fascinating story. And uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's a great read. So, and a, and a great story. And she has children. Is that right? She has four children. They yeah. all are highly successful. Uh, uh, one worked in the in the uh, Obama administration White House. Uh, one's doing uh, uh, a uh, it was working doing social uh, service for underprivileged kids and getting them involved in squash as a as an outlet. And another daughter is one of the uh, most successful uh, uh, real estate people on the West Coast. It's a fascinating family and. Uh, and how she describes doing that in the 60s and 70s is a very different uh, experience. And she didn't think it would be relevant to what people are going through today. And it is more than relevant, uh, I would say that, so. Interesting, well. Wow. Now I'm fascinated by big families, right? And, and especially fascinated by, you could say women who have big families who make careers. Because for instance, like my family, I've got like one, Aunt, you know, one aunt and uncle, they have six kids, another one, uh, yeah, the same thing, but neither one of the wives worked, right? You know, raising four or six kids. And so I'm just always just like in awe of any like family, you know, four or five kids or something where the, you know, where the woman has a career because it's, I think it's hard anyway, right? And really, I'm just in awe, I'm just in awe of that, I assume. And often, I mean, often you'll find very senior women that have one child or no children. Um, uh, and, um, and there are many that have many children, but, but in, in my experience, women that hit the very, very tip top often have one child, maximum two. To, to go over two is, uh, well. Well, in our case, it's a miracle. We call it our miracle third. <laughs> 
to my wife is is definitely but we're in a we're of a different generation where we we like to look at ourselves as a partnership and we were set up by having seen people that are, that were starting to do the same so hopefully that's that'll keep translating through and what what is that what is that line your husband isn't helping he's sharing you know it's not about helping you it's it's not about someone helping you to do your job it's about sharing the job different way to look at it this is true. It's a tag team. Yeah, exactly. And I was always the entrepreneurial one. Uh, and I was always with all the other mothers. And they had to change the uh, the circles, names of the circles, because I was clearly not a mother. Well, and I think these women would be fantastic advocates for why it is that we need to have real comprehensive family leave. As you say, Susan, this idea that, you know, the family care, child care, it shouldn't be like the woman's job that men help with, right? And so if we have really comprehensive family leave, you know, we can really start to, and I'm sure that younger people are, you know, that's what they want. You know, that's what they would be looking forward to, right? That was part of our dinner discussion. And it's the, the hope maybe is a silver lining with the with this gig economy, the flexibility is you know that's really what they've they've, they've needed, and if and if if we can provide that more and more, we'll see where it goes. That's there's a, there's an opportunity that, in that regard. Yeah, it's one of the silver linings of COVID. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen as many men in the parks at lunchtime or at five thirty in the evening walking along the street with their children, with their you know high hands holding children and taking them out. It's been a real revelation, actually, to see so many men involved with their kids over this period. Certainly in the UK, it's it's very, very noticeable. It actually would be kind of fascinating to have a, a deep dive and look at those different decades, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and then now, in terms of um, how it can be best navigated. That would be kind of an interesting format. I can speak to the 80s and 90s part of raising three children and evolving a life from volunteer and civic engagement into your um, passions of interest. And I just got a raise this month because my youngest graduated from college. I feel like I'm running a victory lap, no doubt. I think I think Mark brings up a good point. I mean, we're pretty much of the same generation. My wife has always had a career. You know, we're sometimes going different directions, uh, but we always found time for our children. My daughter's now 20, my son's 17. So it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a sharing and partnering as opposed to mine, hers, whatever. It's, we're all in it together, so. Yep. But this new generation, I mean, as Lauren says, I mean, this, this new generation, I think is taking this, like, is taking this one step beyond where we are. I mean, I'm in exactly the same place that you are. You know, son 17. I've got two other kids that are younger than that, between 15 and 20. Um, but I think that we're going to see people that are under 25 now just embrace a, a whole different lifestyle. And they really are, you know, they trans, everything is transportable, mobile. The gig economy has released this whole new workplace. Yeah, for example, patern paternity leave. I could definitely see that. I can definitely see young people, you know, young families where the 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 man, you know, takes off like weeks or even months, like when a child is born. I can definitely see that being a, a, a new trend. Well, that that would have failed. That would in the UK that would have failed badly. In fact, nobody took it, uh, any of it. Um, but I think that will change now. And I do think people will fit it around working from home in a much different way. But, you know, it, what, what failed 20 years ago is not going to fail today necessarily at all. And I think there's a whole new outlook on how you balance your work and oh, life with your family. So Google uh, offered it and they start and they almost it was strangely looked upon if you didn't take it. And now you hear the stories from and then, you know, that's where you learn, you know, whether it's some of those more, those to the vanguard and they, and then maybe the first people were looked for, maybe you've laughed at by the, but now it's sort of, we'll get used to it and it's the right thing, clearly. Well, 
the Nordics have done it for some time, but even among, you know, even being proximate to the Nordic, the Scandi countries, it still simply has, it's still is lagging here, but, but that's changing. Any last comments? I, I'm, I'm feeling like you're definitely suggesting that there's some great models out there and this actually is another element of mentorship. So it falls very well into the future work discussions also. So it might be um, just another part of that discussion in addition. Absolutely. Well, I've got a 12. Okay. Um, I appreciate everybody leaning, leaning in as always. We'll plan, we'll plan these next events tomorrow at 10.30. Uh, Susan, I already see a slide for your Africa event. We will run it by if we haven't already. Okay. Um, John, I don't know what you, you, you look, you look like you're poised to lead something. I don't know what that is yet, but we're going to figure that out. I'm, I'm happy to. And uh, Susan, I'm happy to help you. I haven't heard from you. So if you still need help with uh, Paul Tudor Jones, let me know. I, don't I know. will. Yeah, that, that would be great, actually. Um, that would be br brilliant. Can you send me your contact information quickly in the chat? Yeah, I will. I will indeed. I'll do it right now. That's Thank brilliant. you so much. I really appreciate okay. it. Yeah, Mark, we can catch up when I'll go on your calendar and talk about what I'd, I'd like to lead if that's uh, with the group's permission. Susan, I'm going to copy down your contact information, too, and put it up there, okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Are you in the UK, Susan? Yeah, I'm in the UK. I don't now. Know. Chris, I'm not to get to Africa. <laughs> okay. Chris, Chris Mayo, you were asking about Tino Go's company. Have you guys connected yet? Tino, Chris Mayo is here on the call. Uh, Chris. Um, no, I, I, I reached out to you on LinkedIn. Uh, you probably haven't seen it yet. He may have stepped away. And and Erica, you connected me to somebody too. Um, uh, oh. Yeah, I just did. I'm sorry. Oh, uh. All good. Well, I'm going to continue over here. I'll let this go for a little bit if you want. And uh, I'm just going to mute myself. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye. Okay, I just put my I just put my stuff up. Okay. Thank you. That's perfect. Just copy that, and I'll bug out. Okay, great, John. Thank I'll, you. I'll send you an email right now. Okay. Okay, Thanks. perfect. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Good luck. Thanks, everyone.